Hello and good afternoon. Thank you once again for tuning in. Today I'd like to discuss some local history that's closer to home. And not actually going to be talking about mud flood today, but I am going to be looking at the old lighting fixtures that appear in Hamilton's most iconic central main downtown area, and that is Gore Park, which is pretty close to King and James. It's one of the major intersections, and it's the main center of the city. And at James Street, it divides the city from east and west. If you had to pick one spot that defined the city of Hamilton, arguably, this is it. Anyway, before I get into that, I'd just like to address a comment that came up on my last translation video, where I translated Evgeny Makarov's uh, video on Moscow. Now, Evgeny looked at streetlights because he's basically looking at these old lanterns and light fixtures and basically stating that they're incandescent light bulbs that worked based upon wireless energy. Well, it's one thing to say it, but it doesn't always make it the case. With that said, I'm actually going to be looking at a light fixture which appears in Gore Park in Hamilton. Okay, so I put together all the pictures and most of these pictures come from a book that I bought from a second-hand store called Around and About Hamilton 1785 to 1985. When I saw it, I just had to buy it because I knew it contained too many great photos of the city in the past and I knew it would be great for my YouTube channel. So here I am getting to discussing this book that I wanted to talk about. Okay, so I went through this book and I've decided that the first video I'm going to make about the images in this book are going to be about just this one area in Gore Park. Okay, so I'll try to do this in chronological order. So first, this is an image of Gore Park, image 26, and I will read the caption. The fountain in Gore Park was first turned on July 4th, 1859. Trees, shrubs, and grass were planted, and the refurbished park was dedicated by His Royal Highness Prince Albert Edward on September 21st, 1860. That doesn't really describe the picture here, but here you can see this fountain, and this is a very iconic image of Hamilton, Ontario, is these old fountains. There are a few other fountains in the city, at least historically. There was one in Woodland Park, there was another a little bit down the street, and then there are also similar looking fountains in Gage Park. But I'm not going to discuss those, I'm just going to talk about this Gore Park fountain. There's all kinds of other history that I'm going to have to omit discussing, particularly the name of Gore Park and where it gets its name. I just won't go into that. It will get too off topic. Okay, so this first image is from 1859, and you can see the fountain, and you can see in the distance there's actually a building called Brown and Gillespie. It's the very corner building. It's just over the left shoulder of the of the fountain, Brown and Gillespie. This building actually gets painted in another image. But anyway, here the fountain is. Now this is interesting because apparently in 1858 or 1859 they have what do they have underground plumbing that pumps water? I mean, a, a water pump is interesting in and of itself. That's a mechanical device. Does that run on electricity, steam, mechanical energy? The truth is, is actually in Hamilton, there's a lot of aqueducts or underground rivers that run under the city. And if I <coughs> was going to investigate and discuss that, I'd probably have to look at the Hamilton Pump House, which is a totally different subject, but there are reasonable and historical explanations for how this fountain is pumping, yeah, pumping water. But that's also a different discussion. I'm just saying that, yeah, I think there are reasonable explanations as to historically how in, in 1859 they had a fountain pumping water in the major city center. Okay, but what I'd really like to talk about is to the west, which is kind of, well, you can see this in a different image. There is this, well, I'll read the caption, the Gore, which is what they call the park. The Gore, circa 1862, Archibald Kerr presented the drinking fountain in 1860. Well, that's a, that's a pretty big drinking fountain. But anyway, what I'd like to point out is not the fountain, but look at this uh, concrete or stone structure that you see in front of the fountain with three men well-dressed in suits standing next to. And then look on this stone monument. There's a, a column and you see lantern globes on top. Now remember this is 
around 1862. And reading other history about the fountain, the fountain went in. Well, he said he presented the fountain in 1860, but I had an image. So this is 1859 or 1860, even up to 1862. And here we have, in this image, we've got a lamp post that looks like electrical lighting. It looks like that. Now, compare that with Evgeny Makarov's lanterns in Moscow that he was discussing. Well, the ones here in Gore Park in Hamilton, Ontario look a little bit different in the sense th that they are globes. Not only are they globes, but they've got these crown shapes on top of the globes as well. Now, what am I to make of this? I'm not drawing a conclusion. I'd probably get a lot of criticism in the comments if I just drew a conclusion, but I'm guessing that maybe this is gaslighting. Maybe. And that would mean that there would have to be some kind of gas line in the ground pumping natural gas into the lights and then the lights would have to have some kind of mechanical device like a pilot light that would turn them on at a certain point and you'd probably have to have a valve that would open and close the gas so it wasn't just leaking out so is this a gas light or is this like some type of light where you pour fuel in it and then you get up on a ladder and you light these globe lights once every night before it gets dark is that what's going on here i don't think so but the the more crazy idea here is that these lights are actually atmospheric electricity almost like wireless energy which is a real thing by the way radio technology is atmospheric electricity that energy that your internet router sends out and your tv picks it up or your computer your laptop computer picks it up that's wireless energy it's not in high voltage but it still is what it is are these lamp posts working the same way and if you're if you'd like to challenge this maybe you have a better explanation as to what's powering these lights I had one comment on my channel when I made the Evgeny Makarov video. Somebody by the name of Frank Daniels said this. He said, The colonial era streetlights were lit by candles placed inside a glass vessel which kept the candle from being blown out by wind. After Thomas Edison pioneered electric use, light bulbs were developed for the streetlights as well. The first city to use electric streetlights was Wabash, Indiana. Now, I'm not one to ridicule people or you know, try to argue with them. So I, I gave his comment a thumbs up and I gave it the little heart thing. And then I said, thanks. I said, thank you, Frank, for your comment. Maybe you're right. And then I said, do you think a guy went around town with a box of candles and a ladder? How many candles can you light around a town, especially in a small window of time when the sun is going down and it's starting to get dark? Well, he didn't respond. Anyway, I looked at Frank's channel. He does have some of his own videos. He looks like a nice guy. Not judging people, but yeah. But I know what you think you see. I used to think these things too. But if I'm honest with myself, these old lights and lanterns, to me, look like wireless ener energy transmission for lighting. So anyway, thanks, Frank, for your comment. I don't blame you. Um, some later images. So here's an image. We don't get the date for it. But this Brown and Gillespie building is now painted a darker color. Notice that even on the corner, there's this different type of lantern that has been installed on the street corner. But if you look at where those original globe, white globe light fixtures were, well, the fixture is still here, but those globes, globe lights are no longer present. So I don't know the year on this picture, but those globe lights have been taken out, maybe vandalized, I don't know. I did come across an even later image, I'll try and find it, which was on the uh, local newspaper, and it looked like they just left the stick like the lamp post, and they even took the top of the fixture off. Okay, 1958, just the stick is left. But even earlier, the top fixture off. Well, 1958 it is. I guess that's the only image I could find. Here's a spectator image of 1860, where apparently everybody gathered to open the park. There is also a Queen Victoria statue very close to where this globe lighting is. It actually sits just uh, about 10 feet behind the globe lighting monument and this Queen Victoria statue was installed in the park in 1908 according to what I read so that's not okay since I'm talking about Gore Park uh, there was two other things I wanted to mention in one picture picture with the number 45 on it I'll read the picture caption the southeast corner of King and John streets looking south early 1860s note the house on the mountain the dirt roads, wooden sidewalks, and gas lamp, and gas lamps. So here's an image here, and Gore Park is just to the right of this image. But here's an image here where you have a lantern, 
and even the caption in the picture is saying that this is a gas lamp and that this is the 1860s. What else can be seen in a lot of these old images is aerials, like aerial antennas. In picture 46 here, it says a young Gore Park, which is in the background, 1867 circa, seen from King Street West, note the archway lane and straight razor atop the barber's pole. So there's two different poles I see in this image. So I don't know which which pole we're talking about, but no matter, a lot of these old buildings have aerial antennas on them. So what's that all about? Is that some type of atmospheric electricity? I guess I should go look up when did Ontario first get power. History, history of electricity sector in Canada. I think I looked this up in a previous video, but I will just read the history of electricity sector the history of electricity sector in Canada has played a significant role in the economic and political life of the country since wide-scale industrial and commercial power services spread across the country in the 1880s. The development of hydropower in the 20th century has profoundly affected the economy and the political life in Canada and has come to symbolize the transition from the old industrialism of the 19th century to the new modern and diversified Canadian economy. As early as 1873, electric arc lighting was demonstrated in Winnipeg, Manitoba, but Canada's use of electricity as a mass market service began in, the, in earnest in 1881 when Ottawa entrepreneur Thomas A. Hearn installed Canada's first water power generator in the Chaudière Falls, and later that year a steam generator lit a public skating rink in downtown Toronto. By 1883, the House of Parliament and Toronto's Central National Exposition were illuminated by electric lights, and by 1885, public street lighting had been introduced in many Canadian cities. Okay, that's as far as I'm going to read, but my point is, is that even before the 1880s, well, it looks like Hamilton had gas lighting, but then I'm questioning whether this lamp is actually gas lighting, and I'd like to know exactly how gas lighting works, because that takes a lot of effort too. What is this natural gas that's piped and plumbed through the ground? Okay, another thing I'd like to mention about Gore Park is that it had an aerial antenna right in the center of the park. This is, well, if we see this image here, and imagine that we're standing here, our back is facing the fountains. The fountain is directly behind us, maybe 20, 30 feet behind us. But here in the park, they have this antenna. I'll just read the image caption. It says, The Gore, circa 1915. The tower was erected by the Canadian Club in 1900 and served as a flagpole until the mid-1920s. The washrooms behind it were added in 1910 amid much controversy. That's something else I'd like to talk about. But anyway, this antenna tower to me does not look like a flagpole and it looks like a very purpose-built structure. Zooming in, it almost looks like there's lights that go up and down the side of it, but I don't know if that's true. Okay, I actually found it. This is what I numbered as picture 27. You can actually see that in the center of the street, in the center of the road, where the man almost looks like he's looking right at it, you see an antenna tower with a flag on top. So I stand corrected, this was used as a flagpole. But supposedly this went up in 1900, and I'm just asking, what was the purpose of this tower? Did they start experimenting with radio? What was that tower used for? Okay, in an image I labeled number 39 on caption 395, so look at, looking at this image here, we have another picture of this aerial tower. The winter of 1926, looking west on King Street East from John Street. So again, we are, we are seeing this aerial tower. Okay. So if I look at the image I labeled number 41, you can see the flagpole in the center of the photo with a flag on the end of it. Looks like the Union Jack. The caption says Gore Park and King Street East from the Bank of Commerce building 1926. Okay, so this old antenna, which goes back to a picture, what year was that? 1910 it's there until the mid-1920s. So mid-1920s, but in 1926 we see that the tower was replaced by a flagpole. Anyway, the question I ask is whether this spot where there was once an old radio looking antenna, a radio antenna, now you have a flagpole. It's very, very tall. It's taller than a five or six story building. And if we look at Google Maps and look at an image today, 
even in that same spot, there is what looks like a sewer grate. Better make sure I have this right. An electrical sewer grate. There's so much more I could discuss, but the last thing I want to cover is these public toilets, which used to be in Gore Park. This is further past the radio antenna. If you want to know, it's on the east side of Houston Street, and there were two public washroom subterranean entrances. So in 1910, I think, was the year that was given. The city opened two underground washrooms in Gore Park. I suppose that's men's and women's. Well, just recently, watching the local news station, they actually discussed how there were washrooms underneath, and that with new city renovations going on, they were going to dig them up and do some work on them. And Well, I forget why they were doing it, but there was a local news story explaining how there's subterranean washrooms in the middle of the park. Now, it stands to be investigated a little further by myself, but I wonder whether or not these below-ground washrooms are actually pre-1860s. Maybe this is like a foundational level from the past, and that's how washrooms were easily installed underneath. I could not find images where the city is building these washrooms. They might exist, and judging by the urinals and the toilets, they don't look that ancient. But I'm saying that maybe the foundation of the building underneath these subterranean washrooms, I think they might be pre-mud flood. Just a guess. Well, I've got lots more to say about Hamilton, particularly, you know, these old telephone poles with bars on them. There's plenty of pictures of that in these old images. And a few other things I might talk about. I might have to make an, another video. The Dragoons coming through Hamilton, Ontario is another interesting one that came up. It's unrelated to anything else I've just discussed, but I'm familiar with a lot of the military regiments and militias that are in Hamilton and are historically from Hamilton, but the Dragoons are not one of them. I'll, I'll look into that and try to make another video on it. The Dragoons remind me of people that came after the Civil War in the southern states. And in this case, the Dragoons coming through Hamilton in 1903, they look a lot like Prussian soldiers. And I'm not familiar with that military regiment, so I should look into that one. But anyway, this was about Gore Park. Hopefully this makes sense to local Hamilton people if you're tuning in. If you don't know what I'm talking about as far as mud flood, well, you have to watch some of my other videos. I hope I haven't... Uh, thanks for watching. Okay, I'm just going to tag on this video to the end. I'm using a screen recorder. And bear with me because this stuff was really hard to re-explain. So here goes. So first of all, do I think this is actually a wireless energy device receiving atmospheric electricity and lighting up these lights? I really don't know. There are other YouTube videos out there which actually go to the effort of explaining gas lighting and even showing people in the UK and in the States actually maintaining gas lights. Do I think gas lights existed? Oh yeah, they, I'm sure they did. But is everything we're seeing in historic old lighting, gas lighting? Well, that's the thing I question. So I'm not coming out and making a conclusion that these are gas lights or electric lights or some other type of lighting, but I am investigating it. And unfortunately, we're only limited to the information that we're given. So I am just speculating. One other thing that came up, which was incredibly confusing to me, is this is the west side of Gore Park. This is James Street here, and pay particular notice to, please pay particular attention to these buildings here. I mentioned them earlier. This is the Brown and Gillespie building, and there's a building next to it, and even these buildings back here. I spent probably an hour just looking at this image and comparing it to later images of the city, because I found an inconsistency that I simply can't even reconcile at this point. Here's another image of this Brown and Gillespie building, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm pretty sure of it now, this is James Street, and that's going up the mountain, that's going south. This is going north, this is east. Thanks for the comment. This is west. If you go to Facebook, there's actually a Hamilton Historical Photos page, which is pretty cool. I did take some of the images off from this web website. Not a lot, but a few. I didn't exactly explain where I got each image. But this image 
is the one that I can't reconcile because this is James Street going this way and this is Gore Park. Gore Park is just over here and that Brown and Gillespie building which I showed you apparently that's here so according to this historical Hamilton book um, around and about Hamilton 1785 to 1985 this is a picture caption it said the Brown and Gillespie building was later the site of the Can of the Canada Life and the Burks building so they're saying that this was the later site of this building here and I have a problem with that because this building is clearly not only is it a mud flood building but it's one of those previous buildings where like it looks like giants built it because the height of everything is like massive compared to the size of your average person and that's a whole different argument that I'm not going to get into in this video once again they're saying this is the Canada Life and Burks building and they actually even say in this image that this was built going back to 1880. Now they're calling it the Hamilton Provident and Loan Society. Hmm, that's a little different than the other picture caption. Here's another picture of this uh, same building here on the corner. Here's Gore Park here. Here's actually a good overhead view. This is supposedly where the Brown and Gillespie building was. Here's another view of supposedly where the Brown and Gillespie building was sitting. Here's the Victoria statue. Here's the globe lights. Here's a better view of those washrooms. Okay, finally I found it. Here's this Burks building where the Brown and Gillespie building supposedly was. And look, the Burks building is clearly a mud flutter. So I can't reconcile these images. I mean, if this is a mud flood one, we know this one goes back pre-1860s. So how can you be saying that this Brown and Gillespie building is on the same site? I don't get it. Okay, so once again, I'm just trying to make my point emphatic so that it's understood. Even in this uh, local newspaper, that's our newspaper here in Hamilton, um, there's this picture, and I'll read the caption. King and James Street looking at where the old Burks building stood and where the 15-story First City Trust Tower now stands. That's the building that's there today. It's a big office bank. So to be clear, they are saying that this Brown and Gillespie building was torn down so that the Burks building could be put up. And this is really inconsistent because once again this Burks building is a mud flood building and it's this really ancient style it almost looks like the Waldorf Astoria hotels in New York and if you had a man standing next to it they would be like a fraction the size of a window or a door. So I don't know. I don't get it. I don't get it. I'm going to go so far as to say, knowing what we know now about mud flood, that um, maybe these historical images are being doctored or changed. Right? I can only assume that. Either that or reality changes. And I haven't discounted that idea, but I like to stay rational and think that somebody adjusted the pictures. Here once again is the globe lights that I was talking about. I wanted to sneak this into the picture. This is Gore Park. Here's the fountain. Here are these globes, this lighting fixture. And you can see that the crown things on top are sitting on top of the globes. As I went through my or original video, it wasn't completely clear to me so I had to fumble through it. There might be, not mistakes, but like chronological things I said that don't make sense. Here's that Burks building here. This is James Street. Clearly there's mud flood. This image was neat. It's looking uh, quite a ways down King Street.
But this caught my attention, and note to self to go look look this up later, this big dome shape. I don't recall seeing that, but maybe I haven't looked hard enough. Hamilton is a city divided from the lower level to the upper level, which is called the mountain, that's what we call it, and Hamilton had a bunch of these old incline railways. Unfortunately, the top of this building got cut off, but it had four aerials. Just like this one here, it had four tall aerials. Here's another picture of these underground washroom entrances I was talking about. Here's the flagpole, which you can see is huge. Here's the flagpole over here. This is the 1930s. Lots and lots of these tall antennas. This is in the Hamilton book I have. And I just want to point out, like, look at the size of these men compared to the size of these windows. They almost look like miniaturized people compared to the house. Just saying. This is on Sulphur Springs Road, which is more like Ancaster, which is West Hamilton. And here you have some men in 1915 drinking from this natural aquifer. Basically, you can just go get a drink at it. I don't know what to say about that, but it caught my attention. The photo caption, the photo caption which I cut off, said that this is an inside of a home at the turn of the century. And I just want to point out this type of stove, because this is something that I looked into on YouTube, and it didn't really come up with much. But it stands to be investigated, too, because almost like those old fireplaces that people are re-questioning, the true nature of? Well, the stove was a little bit similar. This is somewhere on Cannon Street in 1910, and apparently they're building these stoves, and he has quite a number of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, if he's building them, I don't see the manufacturing facility or the nature of how these are being built. I'm not saying that's not true, but I question, like, how? what, what do these stoves do? What were these devices? and why make a stove so sophisticated? This stands to be investigated, but I don't know, was this for heating your home, or cooking, or both? I've seen this type of ball-shaped structure on those old fireplaces. If anybody knows Lister Block in Hamilton, which has recently been renovated, well, they knocked off the old building, and here's what it looked like underneath. But strangely, the road, the surface of the road, looks to be about here, so this is below. Now, what did they keep here? Was this the foundation of something older? I don't think this has to do with the road. This is like an old building. Well, I better read the caption. Reconstruction after the Lister Block fire in 1923. This is in 1923 on Barton Street, and I suppose I could make an argument for how it's a mud flood building, these low windows, but the point I wanted to make is that um, maybe five years before this time, we started to see transformers showing up on telephone poles. And also, telephone poles often had these um, poked-in rods, where I suppose they've turned the telephone post post into a ladder. So I'm back to this image here. I showed this one already, and this is 1899 to 1905. So this is just when they started having electricity officially. But look at this lighting here. It's clearly attached to the telephone pole, and it looks like they just connected right on to it with these with these lines. And it doesn't look like there are telephone pole transformers at the, at this point in time. I'm not saying there's no rational explanation for that, but it looks like you could have, at this time, simply hooked up to the telephone poles directly. Uh, could you have gone up those ladders, connected it yourself safely, and then connected a light directly to it without even disconnecting the power? Uh, I could be wrong, but these are things I question. And I also also wonder whether like altern alternating current is dangerous because of these transformers that they've installed, right? They have like 
um, almost like a capacitor, you have two dielectric plates in a transformer that vibrate. And I'm wondering whether this is what causes pers personal injury in, in shocking. So I don't know. If there's an electrician, you might know more than I do. What I find hard to reconcile is that, well, this is 1905, and across this picture there's all these, like, lines, white lines that go across the picture. I don't exactly see how they're all connected to these poles. I just can't figure that one out. This is, well, near the Royal Connaught in Hamilton, but the point I mention it here is that 1915 we start to see transformers showing up on telephone poles. And actually this is this is an electric company. This is like electron electric electrical components here that actually that's what they make or store. Kind of unrelated but they've got the Union Jack and then this is the provincial flag in Ontario and I would just like to point out that this is an admiralty flag so the flag of Ontario actually is originally a an admiralty flag. Here's an old image I found on Google Images. I zoomed in. The picture is kind of small so I had to zoom in. And here's the Admiral of the Red merchant flag. This is from around 1865. This image was created. Just to show you that the Ontario flag is actually like a British admiralty, civil jurisdiction you might even say, type of flag. And, seeing as I'm talking about this now, I just wanted to point out these flags here. So here's a flag of China, and it has this griffin on it, and Tartary actually has a flag at this time. So these are flags of all nations. So according to this chart, tar Tartary is actually a nation at this time. And the Cochin China flag is very similar to the Tartary flag, as you can see. Uh, just for general interest, the Queen, I think after her coronation, visited Hamilton, Ontario in 1951. Here she is here with her husband, and there's all kinds of British kind of floats for the parade. Here's Gore Park at night, at Christmas time. Here's the monument, but the globes, the globes with that, those light fixtures have now been removed off the top. Queen Victoria is probably obscured by this Christmas tree. Okay, this kind of gets back to mud flood. This is an aerial view of downtown Hamilton. Hamilton is a city that's kind of divided between two geographical heights. So this is the lower level of the city sometimes called downtown. This is the upper level, level of the city called the mountain. But anyway, it looks like mud flow, mud flood, probably came from this direction, which is in the south, and moved its way north down the mountain. And I will just try to show this as quickly as I can, but when we zoom in on the old buildings, particularly these apartments, which I've walked by many times, um, you can see that we've got a two, two and a half or three story building and mud flow tends to flow down and we have a one, two, three, maybe three or four story building on this side. And it's pretty evident as you continue along down the mountain that the south side of the building is more inundated than the north. So this is actually the hospital, I think, yep, looks like the hospital. Anyway, the hospital is one, two, th like three stories, three and a half stories on this side and five stories on this side. Similar features can be found on, I think this is Christ Church Cathedral, which is an Anglican church. Same type of thing going on. This is on James Street. James Street downtown. Uh, this is the north side, so mud tended to flow down this way. This is the, excuse me, this is the north side. This is the south side. Hamilton, Ontario, historically, and even today, is known for its steel production. And I guess traditionally DeFasco, which is now ArcelorMittal, it's got a different name. There's reasons I could explain, but I won't go into that. But there's this old office building that DeFasco had. And you can see that way back in the beginning, I don't know what year, 
doesn't doesn't give a year but the Fasco house was kind of in the middle of a farm field or residential and then it got converted into industry down at the waterfront and about the only thing left from the old neighborhoods was the DeFasco house and this building and maybe there's a building back here too. This is going over to Coots Paradise. Uh, let me think. Uh, the 403 which connects Hamilton. Hamilton's probably over here. And Toronto which is over here about 70 kilometers in between. Um, around here you've got Lake Ontario flowing into Coots Paradise and I've been looking at this to try and determine whether this is maybe a star fort and there are reasons for thinking that although it's not very evident by looking at these images here's actually some better imagery Lake Ontario is probably over this way this is Coots Paradise which is which is a bay but then there's this really old stone concrete no, no like stone block work that's kind of linking the two waterways together and I wonder what's under here because you've got these support structures that are really old and ancient and stone and it's supporting these bridges particularly this one and this ridge goes all the way along the city so I've often wondered what's being covered under here it kinda looks like a star fort not really but anyway it's a big long I don't know what you call this Hamilton has its fair share of trams. Apparently this was damaged during some type of labor riot. This is a neat car to look up. This is a steamer, a white steamer. White is the brand. Uh, this is around 1900, so people were driving around in steam cars. Steam cars. Steam-powered cars. And it's just amazing to look at these old pictures and all these old buildings. The people look very miniature in comparison to the ceiling height. Not to be cynical, but Hamilton has a has had a tradition of tearing down a lot of its old buildings. And yes, according to this picture, they saying they're saying that there was a fire in 1946 at the Hamilton Central Collegiate. But this is a pretty recurring theme in Hamilton, with a lot of old buildings catching fire and getting torn down. This is the city hall, and. I heard a story once that when they went to tear this down in the 50s, maybe in the 60s, that a wrecking ball hit it and bounced off. And what's the reason for tearing something like this down? I don't know. Look at the size of the people compared to the building. They're tiny. So, I don't know, do they have bigger people back then? Is it crazy to think that? Here's some old buildings getting burnt down, but here's an aquifer, like a water source.